why is it called structure from motion? And so basically, I think in one of the next slide, we'll talk about it, but it's really shown on the upper right. So you guys should really sort of stick this figure in your brains. Uh, and so what you see is, is, let's say the red dots are points on the feature of interest. It could be anything, it could be the landscape, it could be um, you know, an outcrop, it could be your car. And so what we know, and it comes down to our eyes, the same analogy of this parallax is that, you know, the, the, the distance away and the position relative to the center of view uh, changes depending on how the viewer moves. And so you can see that as this camera moves around these, these two red dots, which are the projections from the 3D of the model of interest of the target, to the image planes moves and, and it moves in a predictable way. And so that is, is kind of a modified version of this parallax concept, but we exploit how these points that are the 2D projections of the 3D uh, points, how they move in the images to build our model. So we talk about the structure then is the entire geometry of the scene. So that means that the structure of the target, as well as the camera positions and their poses, which means which way they're pointing, and even some of the attributes of the cameras. And then the motion is our moving eyes or the moving view. So structure for motion. And the concept came, I'll say a little bit more in a moment, from uh, navigation of robots. So if you have a robot and it doesn't have GPS, it can use something like structure from motion to figure out where it is, assuming its environment isn't changing. So that's kind of a summary of, of what's happening here. But I want to uh, rewind a bit and introduce this talk with some gratitude to Ed Nissen, with whom we've worked for quite some time. And he built most of these, the next two, the slide set, this main one here. Uh, and so want to give him credit. And so this view below here was something we had worked on and we do have some slides from this. People want to play with it at lunch. This is from the El Mayor Cucupa earthquake rupture, where we had 500 photographs calculated from a helium balloon platform. And you can see with the red triangle sort of pointing at the surface rupture. So, you know, just as a comparison, so the LIDAR, so LIDAR is kind of light laser based distance and ranging versus structure for motion, which is photogrammetry. Uh, so the laser-based systems are kind of active. Structure for motion would be passive in terms of the imaging. The LIDAR is, you know, it's expensive, but a key thing, and we'll kind of keep bringing this up, is it works well in densely vegeted environment landscapes because you actively can push the laser's shots through the veg. Uh, and, whereas the structure for motion sometimes has a harder time sort of seeing underneath and behind vegetation. The LIDAR uh, use, uses precise, precise time of flight measurements, but can be prone to some navigation artifacts, although often we, we think of LIDAR as the gold standard for the geometry and georeferencing. Whereas on the other hand, structure for motion and why we're all here is that it's quite accessible. You only need a cheap camera and cheap software. Uh, it gives us colored points and an ortho photo for texture mapping. And it back solves for the camera positions, but it can have some critical artifacts that we'll talk about. So where it all started. So you see, this is the interpretation of structure from motion. So this is from the proceedings of the Royal Society of London, 1979 by S. Ullman. And it's from artificial intelligence lab at MIT. So you see, this is coming from computer science basically, but it's kind of a computer vision concept. And so in this abstract here says, the interpretation of structure from motion is examined from a computational point of view. The question addresses how the 3D structure and motion of objects can be inferred from the 2D transformations of their projected images when no 3D information is conveyed by the individual projection. So it's a mouthful, but it's just saying what that, in, that initial cartoon was illustrating. So that was step one is SFM. But step two, the big breakthrough, which is later, you see this is 1999, but again, coming from computer vision and computer science, is the object recognition from local scale invariant features. 
And so this, the ob an object recognition system has been developed that uses a new class of local image features. The features invariant to image scaling, translation, rotation, and partially invariant to illumination changes or an affine or 3D projection. So what this means is, as I said at the beginning, we need to find those little red dots. And so how can we find them, especially if the pictures are moving around, they're taken from different orientations. And so this methodology called SIFT lets us do it. And it allows corresponding features to be matched even with large variations in scale and viewpoint and under conditions of partial occlusion and changing illumination. So this little red um, square here is trying to point at kind of the a little piece of a channel, kind of a little eroded zone here where there's a shadow next to this bush. So that's the target we're looking for. Our eyes are really good at this. So we can look and we can see, okay, there it is down there, but it's at a different scale and it rotated, right? And then another one here, it's at the higher and also rotated. And then the one down the bottom is higher, rotated and oblique. Now, if we have SIFT, we can exploit all this because we can find these same point and looking at it from all these different directions, we can really exploit that to build our 3D models. And that's the power of SFM, which includes the SIFT uh, as our, our kind of, you know, secret uh, tool that helps us find those points. So let me, and, and so, uh, I'll stop in just a second, maybe one or two more slides. So one of the things I've always found that was exciting and really clever from this group, Snavely et al., was they use SIFT to mine these internet photo collections. And now it's on the right here showing all the pictures from people who were visiting in Rome around the Colosseum. And they took pictures, as we all do, and they loaded them up to a publicly accessible internet photo collection like Flickr or you know, Google Photos. And so what Snavely et al. did is they just pulled them down and they used them then to calculate a 3D model. They applied SFM to these data. And so the calculation, the result is shown here, which is the scene structure. So it includes the triangles or the sort of little, uh, you know, I guess it's more of a 3D view of each picture is calculated where it was and what its orientation was. And then this point cloud of the Colosseum itself. So that's really, to me, really super clever, but that was kind of one of the first times that was, this was really done as part of their demonstration of the function of their algorithm. Uh, so when we go into geoscience, so this is important if you start writing papers on this is to try to cite these papers. I always remind myself, I'm like, okay, I gotta remember I cite Westaby et al. 2012 and James and Robson 2012. So these two papers came out the same year and they were ones with sort of, Whereas clearly they were adapting the structure from motion to geoscience applications. So West to be at all on the upper right says structure from motion photogrammetry, a low cost effective tool for geoscience applications published in the journal Geomorphology. James and Robson, straightforward reconstruction of 3D surfaces with the cam and topography with the camera accuracy in geoscience application, JGR. So these two are good papers. Uh, although things have moved on since then, but that's where they kind of started. So basically 10 years ago. So that, so now I'm going to kind of talk through the basic idea then of how it works and a little bit more in practice. So traditional stereo photogrammetry, maybe many people are aware of kind of how like the US Geological Survey mapped the US, many, you know, much of, of the world is mapped using traditional photogrammetry with aircraft platforms that are, you know, crewed aircraft taking pictures in a really uniform way. And you'll see this traditional approach requires a bunch of information. But with that information, it actually gives really accurate results. So the key things that have to be known are the distance between each picture, the height from the ground, and then something about the focal length. And then we match corresponding features and we can basically measure this D, this sort of displacement on the camera plane and start to build a 3D model. 
And so this was done for many years in various ways, kind of semi-manually using our brains, which are really good at measuring a lot of this since we do it all the time. This is how we see in 3D. Um, and then you could, therefore, with all that, you calculate what you might want, which is the you know true map di horizontal distance between the features and their relative heights. And then if you know kind of the uh, sort of context, you could put that into like true elevation distance. So, so that's good. It's classical photogrammetry, you know, probably been known for a hundred years how to do this, but uh, it has a lot of, of constraints with, you know, you have to know a lot and you have to acquire things in a very uniform way. In contrast, structure for motion relaxes some of those constraints by using the heavy kind of redundancy of our imaging approach, the basically the motion. So here we have the two cameras and they don't have to be pointing the same direction. And we don't really need to know how far apart they are because we're going to calculate that. But we still have to find the, tar the features of interest. So that's where the SIFT comes in. We still get this sort of displacement on the image plane. And yeah, so SIFT helps us find the points. We talked about that. Once we have those points, there's basically kind of one mathematical solution that will explain where the points should end up on each picture. And so then we can start to calculate the individual camera positions, x, y, z, or x prime, y prime, z prime, the orientations, this i sort of vector, focal lengths, and the relative correspondings of the B and H in a single step known as a bundle adjustment. So we basically take all the pictures, all the Ds, D primes, and our identified that come from our identified targets. And there's only one solution that will explain it all. So the bundle adjustment sort of distributes error amongst them, tries to find the best fit. But the key point is it's basically determining you know, these B and H's or the, the points on the ground, as well as all this information about the cameras. So you can see why it would be interest for a robot, because you might actually care more about the robot position, the camera position than you actually do about your environment. We mostly just care about the environment. We care about the target of the, the environment. So that's where this comes from. The structure for motion is all, the structure is all the parameters. The motion is the movement of the camera or all the pictures that are around the target. And so one, um, one key point, and if you're taking notes, the step two produces something called the sparse cloud. So let's put this in the chat, sparse cloud. Okay, and this will come up later. So sparse cloud is the points that come from this step. And they're the kind of most important kind of key points. But there's not a huge amount of them, but they're in the scene. And so they would be all the collection of all these red and purple dots. Now, the next step then is to, given that information, compute a dense cloud, which basically fills in uh, around all the sparse points. So the dense cloud and a 3D surface can be determined using the camera parameters and SFM as kind of the ground control. So all the pixels are used in all the images so we can densify very much our data and we use something called multi-view stereo matching. So it's not exactly the structure from motion, but it um, needs that information about the camera positions, camera information to kind of fill in. And so that provides, so let's just take our notes here, write this down, dense cloud. And so a lot of times we do a lot of geoscience on our dense clouds. So then step four is the key thing is all of the prior steps have kind of been done in an arbitrary coordinate system, kind of in a pixel-based coordinate system. So the whole thing has scale that can kind of inflate. The internal relative geometries are excellent but we don't know where the thing is in space. We don't know its orientation. We don't know how big it is. So therefore we need to geo-reference it. So we have to uh, do it in two ways. And so the first way is knowledge of the camera positions and focal lengths. And that one, the, the direct way is now most of us, when we have our drones, the drones have 
GPS on them. And so they stick a position onto each photograph in the header. So if you look in the JPEG uh, information, the metadata, it says where it was taken in 3D. And we know something about the focal length. So that we can directly get the, the model orientation scale and, uh, yeah, well, scale meaning the, the size, but also that the distances are correct internally. And that's pretty good. But the problem is often the drone GPS accuracy is kind of low. It's like 10 meters, let's say. And if a lot of our questions are pretty small, like 100 meters or smaller, then we sort of have this 10% error, the, the model sort of floating in this, this error that can be substantial. So the other way is a more, di more it's indirect, but it's, it's strong, which is to, to tell the software, we know exactly where some of these points are using something like differential GPS. And differential GPS might give us positions of within a centimeter. And so that basically will sort of nail the whole model down. It sort of makes sure it's, uh, everything is much more well positioned. And so that's the hard part. I just did it this weekend and it's so tedious. You know, it's easy to fly the drone. It's easy to run the models, but running around, putting out targets and using DGPS is annoying, I find. But it's required if you want to have a really solid model. Chris? Yeah, I was going to say also it's, uh... Unlike in the LiDAR case, the, the GPS is the expensive part, generally speaking, right? Like a good high quality GP, RTK GPS systems cost considerably more money than the, the, the UAS and camera, um, which is not the case for a LiDAR sensor where it's the laser scanner that's the expensive part. But so, so sometimes that's the struggle that people actually have is, is, is you know, at their institution, they may not have a particularly good quality GPS instrument available. Yeah, and I think, and this is a key thing for everyone to think about is, is what we'll learn today is pretty easy. You'll be able to march out and start doing SFM, but this geometry is the place where you need to kind of be uptight and really force yourself to learn more and think about what's going on. Because once you start sharing data, once we start sharing or you start repeating, you see that it's not like the, the things don't align that well and or there's some... Uh, distortions that come in. So beyond the pretty pictures, there is a need to push for, for doing this well. And we can give some uh, advice a little bit on some of the GPS. Uh, Chris and I went back and forth. I bought a new system this year that is really uh, quite durable called an MLID reach system that I'm, I'm now a big advocate for. But there's also, you can do uh, just a regular scale bar inside a model. So if you don't really care exactly where it is, you just want to make sure the scales are good. You can just do an internal, like a meter scale or something. Or for our paleontologists, you know, you could do it as a centimeter. Um, or sometimes you don't mind if, if you have some error. It's just so good that, that uh, or if it's really big model, the, the drone GPS is adequate. So, um, and then once we've dealt with that, uh, once we have our result, we produce derivative products. So a lot of times those are, you know, there are sort of 2D products we'll take into our GIS software, like digital surface models or ortho photos, or the 3D products, which are point clouds or meshes. So this is kind of just a little bit of a summary here. The traditional stereo photogrammetry requires a stable platform with fixed elevation, you have to know a lot of, to do start traditional photogrammetry. And then structure for motion sort of relaxes a lot of that and really lets us do this kind of unstructured image acquisition from the ground, from legacy aerial photography, from uncrewed platforms, and it's really revolutionary. And that's why we're all here. So this is from a few years ago, 2014. This is another good paper, this Venus et al. paper from Journal of Structural Geology. And in that paper, they summarized in table one here, some of the main pieces of software that are used. And so it's, it's even though it's a few years old, it still has the main, the main uh, thing. So this uh, photo scan is now, they changed the name, it's called Metashape, but it comes from the same company, Agisoft. And then the other uh, big, uh, competitor, the other big player in the sort of commercial world is PIX4D. 
So PIX4D and Agisoft or PIX4D, Agisoft Metashape are the big ones and we're using uh, Agisoft Metashape, but there are other free softwares out there. One I've used some is Visual SFM. It's pretty, pretty good. Uh, but a lot of times I find that if you can afford it and for, uh, especially for Agisoft, the, and, and you're, if you're, especially if you can get it as an educator, uh, it, it's worth what you're paying for because it's not super expensive, but the GUI and the integration of the different elements and putting in ground control are actually fairly straightforward where that is not always that easy in some of the other software. So that's my commercial for the software. Um, this is continuing to evolve. So here's our main uh, Agisoft Metashape, which for the academics is is $550, not too bad uh, if you can get at that, but um, maybe not everybody can. And then PIX4D, that's the other big commercial competitor.